Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is columnist Leonard Pitts, Jr. We will discuss his journalistic career and what he's learned from it. Recipient of the 2004 Pulitzer Prize for Commentary, Pitts has been a syndicated columnist with the Miami Herald since 1994. He's the author of three books, Becoming Dad, Black Men and the Journey to Fatherhood, the novel Before I Forget, and Forward from This Moment, a collection of his columns. He has served as visiting professor at Hampton University, Ohio University, and Virginia Commonwealth University. Leonard, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, you have written extensively about uh, growing up in Southern California. Mm -hmm. What was it like in South Central back then? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I wish that I paid more attention. <laughs> you know, part of, the, part of the, I wish that I could go back and have sort of a do-over on my childhood because I think that um, I was this kid who was sort of oblivious to a lot of the things that were going on around me, not just in South Central but in the country at large. You know, these are the years of the, the war demonstrations, the civil rights movement, uh, the assassinations of uh, King, uh, Malcolm X, and the, and the Kennedy brothers. And frankly, if it wasn't happening on the pages of Marvel Comics or, or didn't involve digging up an ant nest to flood it with water and watch the ant run away, I didn't know a whole lot about it. Wow. Well, I, I can appreciate that. <laughs> I, I grew up in the 60s, too, and uh, you know, I remember Woodstock, but I didn't think it was that big a deal. Exactly. They've been talking exactly. about it for 40 years. Um, you went to USC at the age of 15, which yes. is a remarkable achievement uh, from, uh, you know, considering, you know, your background that you've, you've written about. Um, what was that like? Going to SC at 15 was a, was a culture shock. Um, the thing is that I was, I was two years younger than, than pretty much every other freshman. Um, and when you're in your teens... It's not like when you're saying you're middle in your in your later in life. The difference between 43 and 45 socially is not not a big deal. The difference even between 27 and 29 is not a big deal. But the difference between 15 and 17 is a huge deal, especially when you are trying to talk to young ladies for the first time <laughs> in life. You know that was not you know I got I have no car. I'm 15 years old. You know hey baby you know I mean it's it's, it's not working. So that was uh, that was real that was real difficulty for me. Well, you must have done well with the girls that were your age in high school, right? They, they must have been impressed. Not really. I was the, I was the nerd kid, so no, not really. Um, you know, uh, I was I was the kid who, as the pretty girls were walking by, was scribbling love poetry into my in my notebook. You know, too shy to say anything to them. And I find out later from some of these same girls that, gosh, if I'd shown them some of that poetry, <laughs> <laughs> you would have been gold. I would have been gold. Because they, they love this idea, oh, he was too shy to speak to me, but he wrote this poem for me. Gosh, if, I, you know, if, I, if I'd only known. <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, USC was also, besides football, right. at that time known as a very conservative campus. Still, still is, I think. Yeah. And, and uh, a lot of the, uh, the good people that brought mm -hmm. us Watergate had roots there. Um, what was that like? I mean, were you sort of immersed in the conservative culture there? It was a bit of a culture shock, and I ended up, uh, I, if you go back and look at the um, issues of the Daily Trojan from probably 73, 74, you'll find a running battle between me and a conservative guy named Gary Mahoney. I have no idea what ever happened, what ever became of Gary, but we had some, some epic battles on letters pages of the, of the Daily Trojan. It was, a, it was a real culture shock for me. I, you know, I had never, I had grown up in L.A., um, you know, uh, particularly when I was five, six, seven, eight, nine, all I saw was was black people, was African Americans, and I, I really, I was under the uh, the impression, the distinct impression that L.A. was a majority black city. I had no idea that there were white people in L.A. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I go to I go to SC, and it's like, oh, there they are. <laughs> so, you know, I think for a, for a, for, it was the first time I'd been, you know, been a minority in the sense of you know being as part of a smaller group where I, you know everybody else around me was of another group and for a lot of those kids I was their first I was their first black experience too so it was really you know I think it was probably culture shock on both on both sides well that was I mean Los Angeles in the early 1970s there mm -hmm. was a lot a lot going on it's it's hard to imagine now what uh, what that must have been like back then it's hard to imagine that kind of isolation but you know again I was being raised in a world that was that was bounded by you know certain streets you know, in L.A., 
and uh, I don't remember anybody saying you don't cross these these streets or you don't cross in these areas. But that's just this this part of L.A. was our world, and within that world, the only people that were white were the police officers and uh, some of the teachers. And as far as I knew, white people lived uh, on television. White people could be seen on Gilligan's Island, Bonanza, and uh, the Andy Griffith Show. You know, which took place in North Carolina, where apparently there were also no black people. <laughs> that was the <laughs> but this, interesting statistical sampling. Exactly. <laughs> but this was, you know, this was the world as I as I experienced it back then. So it was it was really kind of a culture shock to grow older and realize that there was something else going on. I remember uh, being on a field trip to the LA Zoo, and I was, oh, I must have been eight years old or something along this line, and there were all these white kids, and I was wondering where the heck, where do they come from, and how they get out of the television. And they were like a bunch of little blonde kids. And I remember actually thinking, how will their parents, I was worried for them, how will, will their parents be able to tell them apart? Because I saw this gaggle of blonde kids, you know, running all over the place. And I was worried for them. How are they going to get back to the right moms and dads? <laughs> you know? And it, was, it, it amuses me now because, you know, it was with a child's innocence. But, you know, it, it touched on a lot of the, the issues of isolation and, and, and uh, segregation and all this other stuff. But it was, you know, that was me through my child's eyes. I remember standing in front of the, uh, the gorilla cage. It was me here and this little white girl right here. And she was staring at the gorillas. And I was dividing my time between the gorillas and her <laughs> because both were equally, you know, exotic to me. Both were something I had not seen before close up. Wow. I mean, that's, that's, it's sort of hard to imagine now that uh, yeah. the, the world has changed, the world so, has much. changed yeah. so much. But it, 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 that absolutely was the world in the 1960s. Well, uh, you uh, became a pop writer, a uh, pop music writer, mm -hmm. uh, while you were in college. Yep, I started with Soul Magazine when I was, uh, I guess, 18 years old. So you were already a junior or senior by that time. I was a junior there. in college, yeah. And the thing that was, I think, particularly remarkable about mm -hmm. it is that you seem to have been, have been able to make a living doing that. <laughs> I don't know if I'd go that far. I mean, I was still, you know, mom was still paying most of the bills, um, and I wasn't making, you know, I think... It was, I was a stringer, so maybe $25 per story. And as I tell young people, you know, I know young people look back and say, well, 1976, that must have been a, a lot more money then than it is now. No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> 25 bucks still wasn't, you know, a princely sum. But, uh, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't about trying to make a living from it then because I, I had mom to fall back on. It was uh, just about, you know, being out there interviewing Gladys Knight and Stevie Wonder and Diana Ross and, you know, whomever, whomever. I mean, it was, it was a time of my life. It was a lot of fun. They're pay I, I kept thinking that, um, you know, there's got to be a mistake somewhere. And I, I felt this way pretty much my whole career. They're paying me to do this. And I'd, I'd probably do it for free. I'd probably pay you, you know, <laughs> to do it. But you're paying me to listen to, to Gladys Knight records and then go to Las Vegas and, you know, hang out backstage and talk to Gladys Knight. Sure, I'll wow. do that. At 18, that's At a pretty eight, good deal. Yeah, that's, that's the first time I was ever on an airplane to go to, uh, from LA to Las Vegas to interview Gladys Knight. It's like the movie Almost Famous, if, yeah, you, if you've I've, seen that. Yeah, I really related to that. I really related to that, with the exception that I wasn't kidnapped by, the, by Gladys Knight. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Might have been interesting if I had been, but you know, I, didn't, I didn't wind up uh, you know, de facto part of the entourage of any of the, of any, any of the groups that I was with. But you could have been a spare pip. I could have been a spare <laughs> pip. If I had not been a writer, I, I would love to have been a spare pip, <laughs> you know, or the sixth temptation. I would have taken either one of those happily. So what was the music scene back then? I mean, it wasn't quite the idealistic 1960s, but it, it isn't quite the corporate experience we have now, I think. I had the misfortune to start writing about music at the time that I became, really began to hate the music because it was a disco era. Mm. You know, I, I was, I was, my musical tastes were formulated by like the 60s and the early 70s, the Motown era, the Philly Soul era, all that stuff. And by the time I was actually able to participate, you know, as a, as a writer and as, as an observer, it was Giorgio Moroder, Donna Summer, uh, Lips Inc., oh you know, we're gonna take you to Funky Town and, you know, all this other stuff. And I was just, it was fun, but it was also, there was also a certain amount of agony because a lot of the stuff that I loved was kind of going away. All the artists that I loved, that I grew up loving, uh, you know, those were their down years, say 76 to 80, 81. Those were down years for pretty much all of them. And a few years later, of course, we wound up with rap. Are you a yep. fan of rap? Or are you not a fan of rap? Oh, let's put it like this. And the first, the first national rap record was November 79, was Rapper's Delight. And I remember I almost sprained my finger punching the button on the radio <laughs> to turn whenever that would come on. Absolutely. And now I look at it and there's almost a certain nostalgia for that particular song or that particular era. But no, I'm not a, I was never a big rap fan. Well, you know, in some of the same ways that uh, the African-American mm -hmm. uh, rock and roll artists of mm -hmm. the 1950s uh, 
spoke in mm -hmm. some way to the white kids in, in mm -hmm. suburbia and across America. The, the rap artists of the early 1990s did some of the same thing. They saw all kinds of white suburban kids, you know, singing, uh, you know, Dr. Dre as they were rolling down the street. Yeah, smoking endo, sipping on gin and juice. <laughs> I think I can I can finish the lyric for you. Uh, I, I've always been conflicted about that because to me, what the, what a lot of those artists, particularly the gangster rap artists, were doing was selling sort of this um, this inauthentic version of, of, of African American life under the uh, under the rubric of we're keeping it real. Mm -hmm. So it allowed I think it allowed black white kids in particular white kids were depending on who you believe fifty to seventy five percent of the audience. Uh, it allowed wow. them to, to feel like they were getting the quote unquote real, the authentic African American experience from something that was essentially made up of a bunch of, of, of stereotypes. I remember very clearly being on a radio show and a, and a lady calling in after I'd criticized rap. She was a white lady and saying that she disagreed with me because she enjoyed listening to rap because it, it allowed her to, to understand what it must be like to be black. And I told her that makes about as much sense as me saying that I've seen every episode of I Love Lucy so now I you know, understand what it's like to be a white woman. Not True, <laughs> you know, if if Lucy had to be taken as representative of all, you know, of all white women everywhere, then I think you know there'd be a problem. Yeah, you know, there'd be a problem, and you know, the fact that she could look at, uh, you know, some rap videos, Tupac or Snoop Dogg or whoever was active in that era, and think that she understood a thing about me or where I came from was a little disheartening. Well, uh, you got an opportunity to meet a lot of different artists during mm -hmm. that time, and uh, when you look back on those columns, if you ever. Look back. Were, were there any uh, folks that you thought were going to be big stars that just flopped, or maybe people that you thought were awful that turned out to be big stars? Yeah, on both. Uh, the, my biggest disappointment, there's a guy named Grayson Hugh. This was later, actually. This was like late 80s, early 90s. This guy named Grayson Hugh, who, for my money, should have been Springsteen. <laughs> he should, <laughs> should have been. You know, Grayson, as a matter of fact, you know, you play the mental game of making your Desert Island record playlist. Grayson's album *Road to Freedom* is number one on my on my playlist, and no one's ever heard of him. And he's never the closest he ever came to success was a song called *Talk It Over*, which I think went to number thirty-seven or thirty-eight in the top forty, and that's it. And I think he had a he had a um, he had a song on the soundtrack of *Thelma and Louise*, if I'm not mistaken. And that uh, that's pretty much it for his for his career. And it's like, you know, I predicted big things for this guy. I wrote about him in every in every outlet I could, and just it never happened. So it's it. You know, you feel you feel kind of bad for that because, in the meantime, in those same years, Millie Vanilli won the uh, Grammy for oh, yeah. Best New Act of, uh, you know, of that year. That's He's, rather sobering, isn't yes. it? <laughs> yes, yes. That's why I I don't write about pop music that much anymore. <laughs> well, you did actually. I don't know if a lot mm -hmm. of people know this, but you mm -hmm. wrote uh, for Casey Kasem's American Top Forty. Yeah, Casey's uh, Top Forty at the time. Yeah. Casey's Top Forty at the time. Yeah. Did he ever use his Scooby Doo voice in the office? Or no, I never heard the. No. Actually, Casey was Shaggy. He wasn't Scooby Doo. Oh, that's right. That's Casey right. was Shaggy, uh, and no, he uh, never did hear that. But the, the interesting thing was that uh, Casey's a very committed vegetarian. He's a vegan, and if you'll notice, uh, at some point in the sh in the show, the old Scooby Doo's and the, and the newer ones, Shaggy Scooby snacks became they, there was no meat. They, they became vegetarian. Oh, really? No. If, you, if you look at him, I think in the original ones, you know, Shaggy was eating hamburgers and stuff, but later shows, no. Uh, Shaggy was, uh, was uh, cheese pizzas, I think, was his snack of choice. Oh, man. L little known, little yeah. known trivia. Now that, that's, that's a piece of trivia someplace. <laughs> I don't know if the Jeopardy computer will figure that one out or not. Um, now, those long distance dedications, were, mm -hmm. they, were they the real deal or they were they were all uh, real? Yeah. They were all real. The only thing that we did was to, you know, we'd shape them. You know, because people would write these long, rambling letters, and my job was to shape them using the people's words, but, you know, sort of craft them so that it, you know, made some sense on the air. But those were all real, every last one of them. Well, we're talking today uh, to Leonard Pitts on Conversations from St. Norbert College, and uh, we've been uh, reviewing a little bit about your music uh, yeah. background, but uh, I think more people know you for uh, some of the other stuff that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, talk about how you transitioned, perhaps, from... From uh, writing about music to writing about things that maybe we could say were more substantive. Well, I did 18 years of writing about music, uh, and I tell people that it was essentially the difference between uh, Barry Manilow, you know, I write the songs that make the whole world sing, to uh, Snoop Dogg uh, rolling down the street smoking endo, sipping on gin and juice, and I just reached a point where I, the music was not speaking to me. 
you know, I wasn't feeling it and I needed something else to do. And I went to my editors and asked them if it would be possible to, you know, perhaps do a different assignment. I look back on it now and I think, boy, you know, what got into me to, to, to you know, want to leave a cushy gig and sort of go to these guys and say, how about I just give me a column where I write about whatever I want to write about, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and not think that I'm going to be unemployed the next day. But, you know, to my great relief, they, uh, you know, they said yes. And uh, I began the column in 94, and it's, you know, I've been doing it ever since. And that's when you joined the Miami Herald, right? I was, no, I was at the Herald as their music critic. My last three ah. years as a music critic for the, were for the Herald. I was I joined them in 91, and I wrote music for three years until I just, you know, couldn't go to another New Kids concert. <laughs> well, 94 is uh, the time when we started to know O.J. less of a football player and more of a Bronco uh, buster. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting way to put it, but yeah. I mean, that gave you plenty of fodder to talk about. I yeah. would imagine if, if you're, I mean, you were I did write about OJ. I did write about O.J. during that period, yes, sir. And uh, Hurricane Andrew was not uh, was right around that time, right? Hurricane Andrew was August of 1992, I think the 24th of 92. It, it blew our house away. So is, uh, is Miami better than Southern California? South Beach better than Venice Beach? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a beach guy, so I'm not even going to, you should pardon the pun, wade into that. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, I deserve that. <laughs> wade into that debate. <laughs> well, you know, the Miami Herald must have been quite a place back then. It still is now, I'm yeah. guessing. But, you know, you had characters like Dave Barry running around there, mm -hmm. um, Carl Hyacin. Yeah. Uh, Jim Warren, the cartoonist. Yeah, they're all still there, although Dave is, is semi-retired as a columnist, but he occasionally graces us with, you know, with a piece. Uh, but, you know, all those folks are still there. Jim is still there. Uh, Dave is still doing his thing on an irregular basis, and Carl is still railing at Big Sugar and Big Oil and, you know, who, <laughs> whoever else would, would dare to despoil the Everglades. But it must I mean, when you, I assume that you got into Miami periodically to, you know. Actually, to, I was in, I lived in Miami physically from 91 till 95. And that must have been a pretty crazy place to go to work uh, every day. It kind of, it was and it wasn't. Uh, the thing that you have to realize, that you, I mean, you mentioned, you know, Dave running around and, and Carl running around. I actually had the desk next to Carl's um, and was in, I was there every day. And I, di I didn't meet, for, for the first six months I was in there every day and I never met Carl. You know, I mean, you know, Carl worked from his home. Dave worked from home. I, I now work from, from home. So, you know, a lot of the columnists, uh, you know, you'd seldom see them in the office. I've probably seen Carl Hyacinth. I've been there now 20 years. I've probably seen Carl Hyacinth two to three times really? in life. Yeah, Dave, I've, I've run into a few more times. But Carl, I've probably seen two or three times. Well, I think a lot of people would think that being a columnist has got to be the greatest job on earth. That uh, yeah. all you got to do is punch out, you know, a few hundred words a couple times a week. How, well, how, how hard is that, right? Here's the, here's the deal. Most people, you, you hear this from people and they say, you know, that they could, they could write a better column than, than you or whatever. Most people could write a, could, could do the job for a week. Okay, because you, everybody's got something that they're burning to say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you say that thing, you say something else, maybe you go for another two weeks. But where the test comes is in that third and fourth week. You know, do you still have something to say? And you look and you look and you realize that what you've done when you've signed on as a columnist is you've gotten onto this treadmill that doesn't stop. It never stops. Every two weeks, whether you've got whether you are inspired or not, whether the news is slow or not, whether you've got something to say or not, you've got to find something to say. You know, twice a week from now till forever. You wow. I, I, and nowadays, you know, yeah. prominent col columnists like yourself not only write, but they're on television, all the right. cable news shows. And, uh, I mean, does that make it easier or harder to come up with new ideas? Well, I've, I've avoided, you know, not that anybody's come banging at my door, but I've really avoided trying to do a lot of the, the, the cable news stuff because I feel like my strength is as a writer. I don't feel like I'm particularly um, good as a talking head. I'm not terrible, but I don't, think, I don't think I'm particularly good as a talking head, and I don't think that there's any shortage of talking heads out there, you know, to discuss, you know, whatever. I, I feel like my strengths are, are on the page or conversely on the screen. So I've chosen to try to focus, you know, most of my attentions there. Um, but, you know, the, 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 you get in, you mentioned whether it's, you know, whether it gets easier. You, you, you begin to understand uh, that topics will come. You know, in the beginning, you know, when you hit that third week or that fourth week and you have nothing to write about, you panic. Uh, but after a while of doing this, you begin to you begin to understand that topics will come. You just got to sort of relax and and let them. I believe in the in the in the great God deadline. You know, that's, you know, I believe in the God deadline, and the God deadline always provides you know for His humble servants if they just you know will relax and just you know be cool. 
So what, what is your what is your day like? I mean, you get up in the morning and you go right at the uh, word processor. It depends computer, on the day. Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of traveling. Uh, sometimes I'm teaching. I'll, I'll be teaching again this fall. So there there really is no um, you know routine day or, or or normal day. But the only constant is that Tuesdays and Thursdays I have to produce a column. Tuesdays by by two, Thursdays by noon. I've got to produce uh, six hundred and about thirty forty words on some topic of interest that makes sense you know, and, and get them to my editor. So that's the one constant. And that, that's usually about a five-hour process. Five hours. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm impre- I, you know, as an academic, I have to write. And in five hours, if I get a, you know, a, a well-crafted sentence done, <laughs> I feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> well, the, 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 the thing is that, the, you know, one, you know, repetition in, 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 in doing it, make, you know, you kind of get, get it down to science. But the other part is that, as I tell students when I teach, writing is not what happens at the keyboard. Writing is what takes place in your head. And that goes on, you know, you would hope the day before. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm i writing a column tomorrow, and I'm, you know, mentally getting my ducks in a row, the things I'm going to say, the quotes I'm going to use, the arguments I'm going to make for that column. You know, if, I, if when I sit down to write, that's the first time I've thought about it, then I, I'm in trouble, and it's probably going to take longer than, than, than five hours. But if I've done the mental legwork beforehand, any research needs to be done beforehand, then I can sit down at five hours and, you know, do the actual physical work with not much problem. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, you've written some really remarkable columns, but I'm guessing the one that you're maybe best known for was the one you wrote on September 12th. Yeah, the September 12th column is probably the one that most people know. And uh, from what I understand, you had something like more than 30,000 people respond. I, I yeah. mean, that's that's an amazing response. Yeah, that, uh, that response really stunned me. I really did not see it coming. It really just took me by surprise. And you got to remember, you know, at that time, you know, you're more concerned with, with what's going on in New York, what's going on at the Pentagon, you know, uh, what's going on in, in the country, you know, and sort of, and so that's where I was focused. And this response that started that started that Wednesday morning just really came from out of left field and really took me by surprise. Yeah, well, you know, ten years have passed mm-hmm. since then, and uh, you know, when I was rereading your column uh, mm-hmm. earlier in the week, it was uh, sort of. Uh, you know, watch out! We're gonna we're gonna come get you, and yeah. you know, we're a much more together group of people than you think we are. What has changed? If you were to write that column again today, how would it be different? Actually, I will. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna do that for the 10th anniversary. But to give you a little preview, briefly, we were a much more together people. But I think that what happened is that we squandered a historic opportunity to really, you know, unite ourselves and unite the world around combating, you know, uh, terrorist uh, extremists you know, in the Middle East and instead went off into this sort of side trip, this tangent into into Iraq, which, you know, which we were led to believe had some connection to, to 9-11, but actually had no connection whatsoever. And we squandered a lot of goodwill, a lot of lives, a lot of energy, and a lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of money in this. So I think, you know, we, we basically bungled it. it, it uh, and I'm really, it really upsets me, you know, what happened because we had the, we had, you know, the goodwill of the world on our side. And I think that that's something with which we could have done great things. We could have led sort of an international um, international effort, you know, not just militarily, but in other ways, an international effort to, uh, to, to combat this. I still remember the headline in the French paper, Le Monde, we are all Americans now. Mm, I remember you know, that. And, you know, I don't think that sentiment exists anymore. I think we're largely responsible for it not existing. I think we dissipated a lot of goodwill by, you know, a lot of uh, arrogant and wrong-headed actions. Well, one of the other things that's different now than 10 years ago, mm-hmm. I think, is the role of newspapers in American society. We still have a role? Thank you. Very <laughs> How generous uh, of you. A- absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's true. Well, yeah. you know, circulation yeah. has fallen, mm-hmm. and, you know, there's many fewer people working mm-hmm. there. But uh, what do you see as the future of, of that business? I have heard it said, and I, you know, by people smarter than me and who've done more time thinking about this, that, that they see our future in uh, iPads and similar platforms. And I can only hope that they're right. Uh, you know, the we missed the Internet boat by a mile. We didn't see the Internet coming. And, you know, to, to back it up, you know, there should be a law against allowing English majors to make business decisions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I believe our faculty may disagree with you. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, with all due respect to your faculty, you know, our, you know, the the um, news business, the newspaper business is populated by English majors, and we're great at what we do in terms of news gathering and, and words and all that stuff. But you know, I, the story is told of a newspaper, and I forget which one it was. It had a chance to buy a website in the in the late '90s called Monster.com, and they passed on it. 
you know, we're the same people, you know, who put our product up online and said, well, we'll just give it away. And then we're surprised when people, you know, chose to take the free product and were therefore unwilling to pay for the paid product. You know, and you, and you look at it in hindsight and you say, well, how, you know, how dumb could you be? If I, if I offered you a car, here's a car you got to pay $30,000 for, here's a car I'm going to give you for free. Which one would you choose? <laughs> <laughs> Same car, which one would you choose? Well, geez, I think I'll take the free car, thank you very much. So, you know, you give away your product for free and then you're surprised that your business goes downhill. Well, you know, I think higher ed might be facing the same kind of uh, story right now really? as I do because uh, as we put more and more of our uh, classroom product online, mm -hmm. et cetera, I mean, that services way more people that would not otherwise be able to get it. But what does that mean for our business model? Right. I think our you know faculty in many cases think, well, you know, it's just not possible for it to, uh, uh, to, to ever go away, the college model ever go away. But our president mm -hmm. is a newspaper guy. Mm -hmm. who used to be at the Miami Herald, okay. and, and he, uh, he has warned us of, of this. So it's something we're beginning English to be mindful majors, of. I'm telling you, don't let English majors make <laughs> business decisions. I, I speak as an English major, okay? <laughs> don't let us make business decisions. Well, how many, I mean, just guess, how many people do you think read your column every week? I don't know. I know the circulation of the, pa the combined papers that run the column, I was told, are 30 million. 30 but million. that doesn't mean every, everybody there is reading. I do know this, which is, which is fascinating to me. I, because of that, you know, the, 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 the circulation of those papers and the Internet, I now have more readers than I've ever had at any time in my life. And yet at the same time, I work in an industry that's endangered. You know, and that, that's true of all of us. We all have more readership. That's the, that's the, the, the cruel irony. We're not unpopular. We are more popular than we've ever been in, in our careers, but we are more threatened because, you know, we're not, we're not getting, um, we're not, we have not found a way to monetize the Internet that in any sort of way that really would support the, the product that we put out. Well, you haven't only written newspaper columns. You've right. written uh, several books. Right. In fact, it, I, it looks like you actually put some books together in the 80s about the Jacksons and Bob Hope. And I did some quickie Lambert bios, Rose. yeah. I was. I did like five quickie bios. Um, when people would ask me how many books I'd, I'd written before Amazon, I would just mention whatever I had out. But now Amazon exists, so I have to own up to my. <laughs> I have to own up to my quickie bios that I did back in the. Those were rent money books. Ah, well, you wrote about Bob Hope. <laughs> yes, I did a Bob Hope book. I did a book on the Glamour Girls of Hollywood, Stevie Wonder, the Jacksons, and I'm blanking on the last one. There were five of them. Uh, I don't remember either. Yeah. It, but, yeah, there were five of them. But the Bob Hope one intrigues mm -hmm. me. Why is that? Uh, just, I'm curious, why, why, why Bob Hope? Because that's what the publishers asked for. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they, I'm telling you, these were pay-the-rent books. And what did you find out about Bob that you didn't know? I don't, re I don't recall. I haven't read the book since I wrote it. <laughs> I have to go back and take a I keep saying these were pay-the-rent pay the jobs. You know, you, basically what happens is, you, you know, we need a book on Bob Hope, so you gather everything you can on Bob Hope, all the newspaper clips, all the books that have previously been written, the, the movies or whatever, and you spend two weeks, and then you, you hammer out, you know, you hammer out a book in about two to three weeks. And you get a check, and then you go on to the next one. Wow. Wow. It, it's, I it, wish somebody would offer me that opportunity, it's, but uh, it's, it's not, not happening. It's <laughs> not romantic, I'm just telling you. It's, it you looks know. so glamorous. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, perhaps a more substantive uh, book was your book about uh, parenthood. Uh, Becoming Dad. Becoming yeah. Dad. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what motivated you to write that book. That book was based on an offer that I had from a publishing house to write a, a book on fathering from an African American perspective. They wanted, they'd seen some of the light columns that I'd written, you know, about you know, child, uh, family issues, you know, and getting the kids to wash the dishes or make up their beds, or you know, light and humorous columns. They wanted something like that, uh, you know, in, in book form. And I told them that you know, that's a good idea. But there's another guy who got there first, you know, a fellow named Cosby. Who you may have heard of, yeah, you know, and you didn't have the sweaters. For no, it. exactly. And and my feeling was that if you know, it takes a, it takes a time commitment to write a book, to write a serious book at least, and that if I was going to do that, I wanted to deal with something, you know, deal with fatherhood in a way that would sustain my interest in something that would, you know, that would sustain the commitment. So I countered with an idea to write a book about uh, something that was closer to my heart: how you go about becoming a good father if you didn't have a good father. And they accepted that, you know, counter proposal. And I went out and interviewed a bunch of a uh, bunch of men and told my story and, you know, talked about, you know, that issue. How how do you make a father out of yourself if your father was absent, or was uh, emotionally absent, or was an alcoholic, or was in some other way not performing as a father? 
Wow. Well, yeah. I have more questions, but mm -hmm. unfortunately we're out of time. Okay. Um, thank you so much for being with You're us. You're quite welcome. My pleasure. I uh, hope you enjoyed our show. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norman College. <laughs>